Amen. So listen, this story, like I was telling y'all earlier, this story surrounds the life of a particular individual in the Old Testament. His name is Mephibosheth. All right, can you say that real fast a couple of times? Mephibosheth. Um, so, and Mephibosheth lived in a place called Lodabal. Now, real quick, I just want to tell you, sometimes whenever we start hearing names and places that we're not really used to, then we kind of tune everything out. I've never heard of nobody named Mephibosheth. I've never heard of any place called Lodabar. And so we turn it, and listen, just imagine, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to talk bad about Amelia. I'm just using Amelia as an example. Let's just pretend it's some dude named Jimmy from Amelia. That's all I'm trying to say, okay? So, you know, so that you can, so that you can focus on the fact that it's just, it's a, it's a man that lived in, in, in time during about 1000 BC, he lived, or, or about 950 BC, 900 BC, he lived a little bit after, uh, you know, after Saul was dead. You know, that was King Saul, the first king of Israel, right? And so just so that you understand a little bit of the history uh, that, you know, we talk a lot about history. So you do understand that, that Israel is a nation that exists today, right? And that Israel is the nation that God gave us Jesus through. Amen. And that in the Old Testament, God blessed his people Israel, right? He blessed his people Israel. He gave them a land. And, and there was there's a lot of different time frames in Israel's life. But at some point in time, there was the time frame known as the kings. Okay. The people, the people of Israel that were being ruled by the judges, but they weren't happy with that. And they cried out. They said, give us a king because we want to be like everybody else. Have you ever felt that way in your life? You know, like I'm just saying, like a lot of times people in their Christian walk, they, they start to get frustrated and they remember their old life and then they look at other people around them and they're like, well, why everybody else gets to have fun? Look at everybody else, what they're doing. I, I want, come on, go, come on, Lord. I want to have a little bit of fun. I want to be like everybody else. Well, you know what? The Lord allows people to have their will sometimes, have their way sometimes. And part of the reason he does that is to convince us in our own heart and mind that what we thought we wanted isn't really what we want. Yeah. Unfortunately, many times that takes some time. Anyway, that was where Israel was. Give us a king. We want to be like everybody else. And so the first king of Israel was Saul. Right? The Lord said it. Saul is a type of the flesh. In other words, he's a type of us trying to do things in our own strength or us wanting thing, to make things happen in our own will. The whole time God's plan was David. See, David, I got to tell you, if you've never been introduced to these characters, it's very important that you understand. David was the greatest king that Israel ever had. David made his share of mistakes, my friend. David committed adultery. He committed premeditated murder. The law states that people that do that have to die by <laughs> stoning. But yet the word of God says this about David. This is not okay in sin. Don't, don't misunderstand this. This is not okay. God's not okay with sin. God hates sin. We need to understand that. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. You got to understand that. God hates homosexuality, but he loves homosexuals. God hates people that are bound up in drugs. I'm sorry. God hates dr the drugs that bind people up. He hates the alcohol that binds people up. He hates the pornography that binds people, but he loves the people yeah, yeah. that are bound up. And he wants to set them free. He wants to set them free so bad that he sent his only son, Jesus. That was without sin. That's what the gospel, the, the word gospel means good news. That's what the good news teaches. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that the sinless one would die in place of the sinful one. That's so important that you understand that. God made us, God had caused, caused his son to be a sacrifice to pay the penalty for your sin. To pay the penalty. So David, King David, 1000 BC, 1000 years before Jesus was ever born, is a type of Jesus in some way. You know, the Bible says about David that he was a man after God's own heart. And so, th th listen, you got to be careful you don't start thinking with a religious mindset. You hear me? Well, I've never had struggled with what they struggle with. Uh, I don't, I've never done drugs. Alcohol has never touched my lips. I've never cheated or fornicated. Hold on a second, buddy, because listen. I don't mean to be rude, but you've done something. <laughs> you've done something and fallen short of the glory of God. 
And you got to be careful that you don't start judging. Because I'm going to be honest with you. There was a time in my early Christianity, I was like, how could you say that he was a man after your heart, Lord, after what he had done? You know what the, Lord, you know what the Bible says about David? While other kings lifted up their hearts to idols, while other kings allowed false gods to get into their heart and to get in the way of their relationship with God, David never lifted up his heart to an idol. David was true to the Lord. David loved God with all of his heart. When David realized, listen, I preached on it about three weeks ago, when David was confronted by Nathan the prophet, David repented. David yeah. broke down yeah. and he fell prostrate before the Lord and he repented and he asked God to have mercy. So David is a type of Christ. Saul is a type of the flesh. So listen, there was a story. And in this story, and we're about to read it, Saul had a son named Jonathan. I want to give you a little bit of the background information. Jonathan and David were best friends. The Bible says that Jonathan and David were basically had a soul tie. You know, people, look, weird people try to pervert everything. You turn. I'm just going to tell you right now. You used to go home and you study this afternoon and you start studying David and Jonathan. You're going to come across some messed up stuff. Just like people that are perverted in their mind try to talk about John laying his head on the Lord's chest. I mean, dude, you live, we live in the midst of a perverted society and people are always trying to mess something up, all right? But have you ever had a close, if you're, if you're a man in this place, you know, I've had a couple of friends through the years that I was very, very close to. And I felt like my heart, even before I was a Christian, there was one dude that I was really close to. And certainly since I've been a Christian... I felt like my heart is really closely connected to people. It's not in a weird way. It, it, it's in a good way. They had such a close relationship. Their heart, the Bible says, was knitted. Their soul was knitted together. Okay? Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul was the first king of the nation. David was later anointed to be king. I, if, I don't know if you remember the story. I got to give you some of this background information because it's important. Okay, Saul, re Saul was rejected by God because Saul disobeyed God. It wasn't even God's will for Saul to begin with. I've already explained all of that. And then one day, young David, I love thinking about it. It doesn't say it exactly like this, but they called David in from the field. And the Bible says he was ruddy. So I could imagine his complexion is all red as he runs in from the field after I'm imagining they blew the shofar because he was taking care of them sheep in the field. And he comes running in there and then he gets anointed as a teenager, meaning they poured a horn of oil all over his head. The Bible talks about the, how they would anoint kings and they would anoint priests. And they have a big old horn of oil and they just pour, just slather them in it. That's what the word anointed means. It means to have oil poured upon you that when we talk about the anointing of the holy spirit the holy spirit is like oil amen the oil that ran down aaron's beard it's like the holy spirit is anointing and covering us with the oil of the spirit if you get that analogy right so david is anointed king but i've said it before there was a long time between the anointing and the appointing See, sometimes God will promise something in your heart. He'll give you, he'll speak something to your heart. And then it's like, it seems like the promise is tearing. Or it seems like, okay, Lord, you said in your word that you were going to set me free, but I'm still not free. Sometimes it's a there's a testing period. Sometimes there's a time frame where you have to go through things. You have to endure some things before you see the promise fulfilled. And that was what it was going on in David's life. And all of this time, Jonathan and David are good friends. There was a period of time whenever Saul loved him some David. The Bible says that when Saul would be troubled with an evil spirit, that they called David, Jesse's boy, and he'd play the harp, and he'd sing songs, and then that evil spirit would leave. There was a time whenever Saul was all about David. And during that time frame, Jonathan and David made a covenant with one another. What is a covenant? Well, in human terms, a covenant is an agreement. I agree with you, you agree with me. God's word is built upon covenant. Amen. It's much deeper than just saying that you and I agree on something. The Bible says that because God could find no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. The easiest way for me to describe God's covenant to you is that in the Old Testament, there were always two representatives that represented groups of people. Okay. I don't mean to be weird and use a bad analogy because 
you know, it was a very violent movie, but anybody ever see Braveheart before with Mel Gibson? If you saw Braveheart, whenever they met on the battlefield, Bra Bra Mel Gibson's over there, right? He got his face all painted up, and, 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 he, and he's going to meet the other people, right? And they sent, they sent an envoy, like two or three people on horses that came forward, and the army was behind him, and then Bra and then Mel Gibson and two other people, they ride up, and the people on the horses meet in the middle of the battlefield, and they talk back and forth. They're the representative of the larger people group that are behind them. Does that make sense? That's kind of how covenant was, but in the Old Testament, the way covenant was, was there was always a representative of a people group, a representative of another people group, and then there was a sacrifice that sealed the covenant contract, if you will. And what they would do is they would split that animal down the middle and then they would walk through it and they would literally say, if one of us breaks this covenant, I'm just giving you an idea of what covenant was like in the Old Testament. If one of us breaks this covenant, then what's going to happen to the person that breaks it is what happened to this carpet. Now, what God did in his covenant was, is this, the Bible says, because he could find no one greater to swear by, the word of God says that his eyes roam to and fro. He's looking, church. He's looking for people that are faith, faithful. And listen, there are people that love the Lord. There are people that serve. But he could find no one. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 5. It says in Revelation chapter 5 that, get, that guess what? That John the Revelator was weeping. He was weeping. And you know why he was weeping? Because he said that there was nobody worthy to open the scroll. Nobody in heaven and nobody on earth. That means that there's never been a human being that's walked the face of the earth except for Jesus who died worthy, amen, to open the scroll. There's never been a human being that was without sin. So because he could find no one greater, talking about God, he, he was the promise. He was the representative of heaven. He was the representative of earth. See, God became a man. Amen. And he was the sacrifice that pulled the whole thing together. So I want you to see that in Jonathan and David, that covenant that they had with one another was very similar or is a type of the covenant that God has for you and I. And there was a time whenever Saul loved David, but then there was a time when Saul became very, very bitter towards David. Now I'm really getting ahead of myself and I know that I have it in my notes somewhere. I'll just try not to repeat it. But you know, one of the things that happened is this, is that as times got bad and Saul became bitter, Jonathan did a very beautiful thing. I got to tell you, man, Jonathan was a man of God. Because listen to me, think about this. Most of us are so selfish in our mindset. That what we're really consumed with is ourselves. Come on, somebody help yes, me. Yeah, I'm telling the truth. I'm preaching better than you're amen. And because listen, <laughs> most of the time we're so consumed with ourselves and how life circumstances are going to affect us. And we constantly putting ourselves up. And look, the word of God says in the book of Philippians, prefer your brother over yourself. And many times we think more highly of ourselves than what we are. Jonathan was, in the eyes of the people, the rightful heir to the throne. Listen to me. He was Saul's offspring. When Saul was going to die, Jonathan was supposed to sit on the throne. But Jonathan knew that God had rejected his father and had anointed David, his best friend. And even whenever things went south with Saul towards David, Jonathan stayed true to his relationship with David. Jonathan went before and he warned David, listen, my daddy's starting to act weird. My daddy around the dinner table is starting to use your name in a bad way. Things are getting ugly for you. you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a signal. If things are not good in the land, I'm going to send you a signal and you need to take off and you need to protect yourself and you need to run. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is this, is that Jonathan stayed true to his covenant with David, even in the bad times. Can I tell you that I just want to use that as one little quick idea, is that you and I are supposed to stay true to the Lord in the good and the bad times. Amen. Amen. By the grace of God. Now, I'm not trying to encourage you to do something in your own strength because you'll never do it in your own strength. As a matter of fact, if you walk in this place this morning and you're feeling beat down because you feel like you keep failing God, I just want to tell you to hold on. I just want to tell you to hold on. 
Because I remember whenever I walked in that barroom bathroom that night after being a Christian for 12 years. And the Lord showed up in that barroom bathroom. I don't have time to talk about the whole story. And the next morning I said, Lord, I can't do it. Lord, I can't do it. I keep failing you time and time again. I can't do it. I need you to do it. I want to tell you to hold on, Christian. I'm not trying to give you a license to sin because it's not God's will and God hates sin. But I'm trying to tell you, don't quit. The enemy wants to try to make you quit. We're going to have to do our, it's God's will that we would serve the Lord in the good times and in the bad times. When it's easy and when it's difficult. We can't be fair weathered friends of the Lord. And whenever it's convenient for us that we serve God and when it's not convenient that we just do whatever it is that we want to do. I just want you to know that's the story behind the scenes that David and Jonathan had a covenant with one another. And David promised, whenever Jonathan said, listen, I'm going to warn you. I'm going to warn you. But look, would you just do me a favor? Would you take care of my offspring? Listen to me, church. He said, would you take care of my people? After I'm gone, would you take care of my people? All right. So now we're going to start the story of Mephibosheth, who lived in Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings or the news came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. What is the news? The news is, is that they were both died on the battlefield all in one time. They were driven through with, with, with spears and they both died at the same time. Both Saul, the king, and his rightful, in the people's eyes, heir to the throne, Jonathan. And, they, and, and so it says that, that Jonathan's son was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel and his nurse, that's a nursemaid, you know, um, she cared for him. She was like his nanny, um, you know, whatever, that's good enough. And fled. She took him up and she took off. She fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame and his name was Mephibosheth. We're about to go now to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, and we'll just read the whole chapter. So one day out of nowhere, David says, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Are you Ziba? He said, Your servant is he. The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and re will restore you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto your master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall till or plow the land for him and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, 
He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did continually he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. You know, I could go on and on about how many times it talked about the fact that he was going to eat at the king's table. I could go on and on about how many times it mentioned that he was lame in his feet. And I got to tell you that when God repeats himself in the Bible, he wants you to get the attention. He wants he wants to get our attention and he wants to make us aware of something that he's saying. You know, one of the first things that sticks out to me in this story is in 2 Samuel 4, 4, where it says, the nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee. That word haste describes unnecessary quick action. It describes thoughtless or a rash decision. Something that wasn't really thought through. You know, I was thinking, how many times do you and I react based on the circumstances that are around us? We're all guilty of it. We see the situation change around us. And whenever these situations take place, we hurry up and we make a decision, right? We don't really go to counsel with the Lord. We get frustrated many times. And we something you ever felt that way before whenever it's almost like fear or frustration will grip your heart and you become anxious in a situation and you make a decision and then the decision that you make ends up making the situation even worse than what it was before. Can I get an amen? amen. Her decision in haste to hurry up. You know, now listen, to be fair to this nurse, this nurse lady, she probably, she may not have even known about the covenant between Jonathan and David. I don't know that they broadcast that in the land. But whenever she heard the story, the Bible says she made haste. She picked him up and she fled. And guess what? She fell with that boy and he became crippled. I got to tell you that many times in our own lives, whenever things happen, situations take place, we begin to make decisions that end up causing us to become spiritually lame. We hem ourselves in. We kind of like cause ourselves to become crippled, so to speak, in a spiritual way to where we can't really continue to move in the way that God would have us to move. You know, I want you to know that God can do great things with spiritually lame people. People that are restored. Spiritually lame Mephibosheths that are restored. Amen. But I got to also tell you something else. That Mephibosheth was living in a place called Lodabar. That word Lodabar literally means no pasture. It means a barren land. I've never done this before, but I was told by a mission, by a pastor in, in the local community. He used to do mission work in Jamaica. And he said that you can literally see when you would fly into Jamaica over Haiti that it was completely barren. That it was brown. The ground was, there was nothing that would grow there. And it is almost as soon as you would cross over into Jamaica, the ground was lush. It was green. And there was, and you know, the point is, is that in Haiti, the actual religion is voodoo. They practice voodoo. That's their national religion. What, but what the main point that I'm trying to make is, is that Mephibosheth was living in a place called Lodabar. And while God can certainly do a great work on the inside of our lives, and even though we're lame and we tend to be crippled and we're not moving properly, it is never God's will for you and I to stay in Lodabar. Where is Lodabar? I mean, for each and every person, Lodabar can be a different place. But I can tell you that Lodabar is the place that is barren. It's the place that is unfruitful. It's the place that if you've been living your life and staying in the same place and, it, and your life is staying unfruitful and that, you know what? It's not God's will for you to stay right there. Amen. It's God will, God's will for you to get up and to move into the house of the king. God wants you to know that you're welcome to eat at his table. God wants you to know that he paid a high price so that you can eat continually at the table of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I want you to know that whenever, even if you look at Psalm chapter 23, one of the last things that, that David says in Psalm 23 is, he says that the Lord has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemy. 
Whenever Mephibosheth was able to eat at the table of the Lord, that's descriptive of communion. Eating at, the, eating at a person's table is a very, a very intimate thing. Amen? You don't just invite anybody to come. I mean, we should be gracious and we should be willing to, you know, to be hospitable. But it's still, it's kind of like a little bit of a different thing just to be inviting people in your house to come eat at your table. It's a very intimate thing. And I got to tell you, though, it's descriptive of communion. It's talking about intimacy and relationship. Amen. Whenever David, as a type of Christ, says to Mephibosheth, a crippled, lame person. See, I don't know about you. You might say, oh, I'm not crippled and lame, preacher. I'm running. Okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that mankind is crippled and lame. I'm here to tell you that just as that nursemaid picked up Mephibosheth and took off running and fell, the fall of man has called man, caused mankind to become crippled and lame. The Word of God says in the book of Hebrews that the Lord wants to straighten out the lame feet that are going in the wrong direction. See, when you got a lame foot and a kid's causing you to move in the wrong direction, the Lord wants to straighten that out. He wants to heal it. He wants to bring us back into communion and relationship relationship with him. Listen, from now on, what we got to realize is, is that whenever things happen in our lives, that what we got to do instead of making a knee jerk reaction, help us Lord, help the preacher Lord, that we would go to the Lord and that we would pray and that we would get his wisdom. Amen. That he would help us to make the right decision. Amen. So many times we make these decisions and they cripple us spiritually. Satan tries to keep us ignorant of the word and the ways of God. He tries to keep us crippled and lame so that we can't move forward in Christ. And many times he gets away with it because we don't understand the covenant or the agreement that we have in Christ. I got to tell you that, that God... That God is more powerful than your situation. I hope you believe that this morning. And I can't convince you of it. I mean, you know, I used to preach even harder than what I am right now to where people would make fun of me because I had veins popping out of my forehead. Guess what? I can preach so hard that the veins pop out of my forehead. My face can turn red. That ain't going to change nobody. Right. We need the Holy Spirit to make the Word of God real. And I'm here to tell you this morning that even though our name might be Mephibosheth and even though spiritually we might be lame and crippled because of the fall, we do not have to continue to live in a place called Lodabar. Oh, but the enemy keeps on coming back. Well, guess what? Quit answering the phone. Amen. Oh, but, 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 but you know, but no, change your phone number if you have to. Oh, but I don't like doing that. That seems like, you know, whatever. Yeah, okay, it seems whatever, but you keep on answering the phone. It keeps on bringing you back to the place where you know that you're not supposed to be. Quit answering the phone. Quit going to Lodemore. Quit going to the neighborhood. Quit going down that street. Quit going to that place that keeps tripping you up and keeps causing you to become crippled and handicapped to where you can't walk for the Lord. Amen. Amen. You got, listen, there is a partnership that you and I have to work with the Lord. I'm trying to make a point. Jesus, hallelujah, went before us. He's already done it. The Bible says when he died on the cross and he breathed his last breath, the last words that he spoke were, it is finished. That means that he destroyed Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Principalities and powers. What are you talking about, preacher? When Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed the powers of darkness. I'm here to tell you, simple faith in the finished work of Jesus will release the power of the Holy Spirit in your life and give you a victory in your life and bring you up out of Lodabar and to put you at the king's table where you can eat continually of his bread. But guess what? You got to be willing to go. <laughs> you got to be willing to go, my friend, because if you're over there living in Lodabar, man, I kind of like this place. You, you know, half the time, we can't even see how messed up it is in Lodabar because we're living in a facade. <laughs> I mean, dude, it's all dried up. The cows can't even graze because there ain't no grass. Got skinny cows across the street when you look out the window. <laughs> Everything's lean. The money just, I don't know about you, but I done had holes in my pockets before. The money just pouring out. You can't keep nothing. You can't have nothing. <laughs> right? And we're over here saying, oh, man, a load of bars is fun. No, a load of bars is not fun. <laughs> Ain't nothing fun about a load of bars. 
It's a temporary pleasure, a temporary moment that's not going to last. And it's just going to mess you up. It's going to pull you away from the Lord. And every time you get moving in the right direction, the enemy's going to try to call you back to work. You're going to keep trying. No, 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 no. Don't leave this barren land. It's good over here. No, no. There ain't nothing good about it. I don't know how to get free. Look, Philippians 4.13. You can go there. Philippians 4.13 says this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't say I can do all things because I have arrived. No, 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 no. You can do all things. Why? Through Christ who gives you strength. The Lord wants to give you strength. It's just like the king says, hey, Zeba, get your servants. And get over there and start plowing that ground. Oh, look, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I want to save that for the end. But I'm here to tell you that when the Lord goes to work for you, yes. when the Lord goes to battle for you, yeah, amen? I don't even have it in my, in my passage of scriptures right here. But in Matthew, what did the Lord say? Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. Come unto me, you who are weary and overburdened. Come unto me, you who are tired, and take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you will find rest for your weary souls. You know, I know I've said this so many times and I've preached it, but some of y'all are kind of new. Uh, you know what a yoke is? And the only reason I say that is I know I've said this too. So y'all probably going to fire me one day because I keep repeating saying it. But one time, whenever, whenever I first met Danielle, she had some song on her radio. And I told y'all already, I used to think Christian music was lame. And, and so the song says, come and break the yoke, Lord. Come and set my spirit free. Come tear down the walls of pride and all I hide beneath. The nail scars in your hands, they prove that your love for us was not a joke. Do what you must, but break the yoke. I thought it was an egg yolk. <laughs> I thought it was an egg yolk. Break the yolk, Lord. You know, you know, fried egg. No, a yolk. A yolk is Y-O-K-E, not Y-O-L-K. A yolk is two pieces of wood that connect two beasts of burden, like two ox together, so that they can plow a field. The Lord said, take my yoke upon you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, I'm the one that's going to do the work here. You connect yourself to me and trust me. You're over here trying to get, you know, I got some people that I talk to. They're like, I'm just trying to get it all squared away. I'm getting all my little T's crossed and my I's dotted. And I'm getting my little life all together. And once it's all just right, then I'm going to serve the Lord. No, 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 no. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because you ain't never going to have your life together. Amen. Come on, somebody. Every single time that you think that you're making headway, the Lord is going to allow a trial to come into your life. Amen. He's going to allow it, friend. Quit getting frustrated every time you turn around. And you're like, it never gets a break. The Lord's not going to allow it. Yes, he will give, but he's going to give you grace. He'll give you grace to make it through. He'll give you grace to strengthen you, but he will constantly allow a trial to take place, a test to take place. And he, and he wants to prove himself to you in the midst of that. So no, you're not going to get it all just right. And, and, and if you sit there and you think that, you, will, you know what's going to happen? You will stay in Lodabar for the rest of your life, and you will look like one of them skinny cows across the street, and you're just going to dry up. Spiritually speaking, and you ain't ever going to move forward with the Lord. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 11 says this. It says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body. That word quicken, you know what it is? It's a King James word. You know what it means? To give life. The same spirit that gave life to Jesus' physical body will give life to you spiritually speaking. If you read it all the way through and you go to Romans 8.37, there's a whole lot of stuff that's happening to people in those verses in between. But it says right here, we're more than conquerors 
through him that loved us. I got to tell you the good news this morning. You can't do it on your own, but guess what? You don't have to because one day out of nowhere, David just said, is there not someone of the house of Saul that I can bless? And the Lord's eyes are roaming to and fro and he's looking for a broken and a contrite spirit. He's looking for somebody that he can bless spiritually and he's saying, is there not someone of the house of Saul that I can bless? The Lord wants to bless you, my friend. He wants to bless you and he wants to pull you out of that barren land and he wants to put you at his table and he wants you to be able to commune with him and have relationship with him. You know, a specific person in an Old Testament story is a lot different than the New Testament church. Sometimes we don't really think about this. Is it okay if I just just talk to you from a real, from just being real this morning? I hope I can. Yes. I, yeah, you know. And listen, I don't even know what the ultimate answer is, or even what I'm trying to get across, other than I do know that as a pastor of a church and, and desiring to see, you know, people flourish in the church, I'm not looking, I, I've always said this, I'm not looking for a church that's filled from wall to wall with people. That's, as a matter of fact, whenever I pray, and anybody that prays with us in the back room knows that, I'm like, Lord, send the people here that you want here. Because I'll be honest with you. You might want a big old church wall to wall, but I've already learned something. The more people you got, it's kind of like the proverb says, an empty stall, there's less mess. When you put an ox in the stall, you can get a lot of work done, but guess what? There's also a lot of mess to clean up. Did you not know that human beings are messy? Amen. Is it okay if I say that or no? It's not okay? Because Lord knows, Matt knows he's kind of messy himself, right? So what I'm trying to say is, is that I'm not looking to have people from wall to wall. I just want the people that the Lord wants in this place. Amen. And I want the word of God to go forward and to do in people's lives what I know the word of God says it can do. Right. It says it can set the captive free. It says it can move you from low to bar and put you at the king's table. And that's Really, what, what I'm trying to see, but you see, whenever the, whenever the church of God, whenever the people of God remain crippled in Lodabar, it makes it difficult for the church to move forward in the ways that it's supposed to do. I mean, listen, and it's okay if you want to do that, because Lord knows I've had to grow up and to get some tougher skin. I remember, look, I didn't agree with everything Brad Bullock said. Okay, that was my old pastor, but I remember him telling me one time, and I said, dude, Cause I, I, I remember he said, he said, man, that lady, that lady told me after service, she didn't like my haircut. I'm like, really? I'm like, she didn't like your haircut. I mean, how does she feel about your message? I mean, your message was pretty good. And she didn't like my haircut. I'm like, dude, that's like ridiculous, man. You gotta have this, this pastor and stuff, dude, keep it. You're not even going to sit there and focus on your hair, dude, and it wasn't even a bad looking haircut. It's like, give me a break, man. Like, you over here focus on your haircut, man. What about that message you just brought? What about, what about the truth you, you, you just spoke? He said, you know, Matt, I've learned something. If you're going to be in ministry, you're going to have to have a soft heart and tough skin, you know? And I've learned that. I've learned that a little bit through the years. Don't get me wrong. I still cry in the corner sometimes. They go, they don't love me. But you know, one of the things that I've learned is this, is that it ain't all the preaching, my friend. Amen. You see what I'm trying to get at? Oh, he didn't really preach too good of one this morning, boy. Last week was better. Well, maybe so, but guess what? Maybe it's you. <laughs> and I'm just being real. Maybe it's your heart. Maybe you ain't right. Maybe you need to get right with the Lord because I guarantee you one thing that's going to come out of this pulpit is the truth. It might not come across all flowery and beautiful, hallelujah, with articulate words and he waxed eloquently, but it will be the truth. Amen. And so sometimes, though, we over here staying in low the bar like Mephibosheth, and we all broke down and crippled. And guess what? We so worried about our own lives and what we're doing, we're not really worried really about what's happening with the church. Amen. And listen, I'm not just talking about building a local ministry because that's another thing. I don't mean to get off on all this. I want to be careful. I don't keep you too long, but I'll say it. Maybe he's watching this morning. For every beautiful thing that Brad Bullock said, there were some things that he said that, like, I didn't understand. And I can remember one time leading somebody to the Lord at work. 
at the clinic. Somebody, I don't know how it happened, but the door opened up. I talked about Jesus. They were like, I think I need to pray that prayer. I prayed the prayer of salvation with them right there. Like, come on, just receive Jesus in your heart. I go to church that night, Wednesday night. I'm like, dude, man, God opened up a door and I was able to minister to this person. And he's like, we need you to move to Franklin. And I'm like, what you talking about, man? Well, we need you to move to Franklin so you can bring them to church at. The point was is that he wanted to, and, uh, Lord help him because he might not have meant it. But what he was saying is, is that we need the people that you talk to to put fannies in the seat. And I was like, dude, we're building the kingdom of Jesus Christ, not the kingdom of crossing place, not the kingdom of crossway. We're building the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I are supposed to be witnesses. And if people end up coming to church here, praise God for that. And hopefully they can grow and they can experience truth and they can get strong in the Lord. Praise God. But guess what? Even if they don't, if you ministered to somebody out there, if you planted the seed of God's word in somebody's heart, you're functioning as a believer. Amen. You're functioning the way the Lord would have you to function. I'm just trying to say the Lord that one is crippled and loadable. I'm trying to say that whenever we stay in loadable and we stay crippled, then guess what? The, the local ministry, because God did oh, God did start this ministry. I'm going to tell you that right now. And the word of God does say that I've given you an open window, a time frame. And the Lord said this, work while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. That's right. The night's coming, my friend. Yeah. I don't know when it's coming, but it's right there. It's knocking on the door. The sun's setting. And it's getting darker. And the night's coming when no man can work. So we got a time. We got a, a period of time. And what the Lord wants us to do is he wants us to trust him. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to move out of Lodabar. He wants us to move to the king's table. And he wants us to eat bread and to have communion with the Lord. So that we can all grow up into a, 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 the body of Christ. Yeah. Amen. So that we can function and accomplish God's will. Amen. So this is, I'm closing with this. What good does it do, God or his kingdom, if his people are staying lame and low to bar and never moving? It's a good question. These are just a couple of things that stuck out to me. I don't know. I got like five things that stuck out to me. In verse 1, you don't have to go back there, but it said, Is there anybody that I can show kindness? Or I'm going to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. That's what David said. I'm going to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. I believe that was 2 Samuel 9. 1. And you know, one of the things that I wanted to say is that God is committed to covenant. I want, I want to tell you that, Christian. He, listen, so many times we walk around, and I know it's true because I myself have lived in that place. We walk around with a cloud of guilt over our head, a weight on our shoulders. Because we failed the Lord again. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. We failed the Lord again. I'm weighted down. I feel unworthy. I'm here to tell you that God is committed to his covenant. Amen. He loves you. And I can't really, words would never be able to speak it enough. He loves you so much. And he's committed to this covenant that he has provided in Jesus. I will show him kindness. For Jonathan's sake, just because of the goodness of God, he wants to show you and I kindness. Amen. In verse six, whenever Mephibosheth came unto David, you know what it said? It said he fell on his face and he did reverence. It says Mephibosheth fell on his face and he did reverence. Now, I don't want you to walk around always saying what Mephibosheth said, but sometimes I know I've said it. What am I that you would pay attention to a dead dog like me? That's what Mephibosheth said. Have you ever thought that before, though? Like yeah, whenever absolutely. God's grace yep. will be poured out on you and yep. you realize, man, I just messed up yesterday or I messed up last week. But yet the grace of God will overwhelm you and you're thinking to yourself, Lord, why would you show kindness yes, to a dead dog like yep. me? And you know what, what he did, though, was he referenced himself. That's really Jesus. the point I want to try to make. Is is to humble yourself in the presence of God. Listen, you know, that's fine if we're going to do it at these altars. You know, that, that's fine. But look, you know where you really want to do it? That, this is my opinion. At your house. <laughs> right? 
when nobody else is around. Like, like when your wife ain't even around. Or, 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 or your husband or whoever. Like you and the Lord alone. You ain't trying to, you're not trying to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You're trying to get along with the Lord. You're trying to get your heart right with God. And let me tell you something. When you do that and you humble yourself in the presence of God, he will do a great work. Amen. On the inside of you. In verse 7, he says, Fear not, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. That, that word restore is what, is what stood out to me. And I put in my notes, God will supernaturally restore what's been taken. And you will sit at the table with God. You will be a communion with God. I cannot emphasize this enough, Christian. I don't even know how to describe it. But whenever you humble yourself in the presence of God, whenever you say, Lord, I want to serve you, and you begin to partner with the Lord, something spiritual begins to happen. I'm telling you, it doesn't happen overnight. If you're looking for a microwave Christianity, then you're, you're come to the wrong church. That's not what I see in the Bible. What I see in the Bible is that God takes you one step at a time, one step at a time. And then guess what? You'll look back five years, 10 years, and you will say, wow, God has truly brought restoration in my life. Everything that I had lost because of my own sin and my own decisions, because of my hasty knee-jerk reactions, everything that I created as a mess for my life, whenever I humbled myself before the Lord and chose to serve Him, I can truly look backwards and see God's hand has been in my life and He's been restoring things to me. I want to encourage you with that. There's nothing better than being in communion with God, Christian. Amen. There's just not. To have the presence of God walking with you and going before you. You can't even figure it out, man. You know what I'm saying? Just at the, I, I can't even talk enough about the Lord. Just at the moment whenever you think and you don't even understand, God's actually behind the scenes working on your behalf. And, and a lot of times, and some people have more faith than other people. Amen? You, you, have you noticed that? I mean, th there's some people that have more faith than other people. You know, I was thinking... I know that I'm going wrong, but forgive me. I'm going to just, I'm going to admit to you, like, I spend a lot of, sometimes I spend money on things I probably like, but I get, sometimes when I go on vacation, I get a massage. Okay? So I'm just going to tell you, like, this little story. <laughs> so this whole thing that went down with this whole religious exemption, right? I look at my schedule. I'm about to go get a massage. I look at my schedule, and they had sent me a letter in an email that said, your religious exemption is denied. Your last day is December the 5th and you're terminated, okay? So then I look at my schedule, I'm about to go get my massage and every shift in December is gone except for December the 6th, which is a Monday. And I'm like, dude, that's kind of weird. Okay, that's fine though, y'all in a bind, I guess. Y'all in a bind, y'all need somebody to work on Monday, I work, that's fine. But let me call up the scheduler and talk to her. And I said, look, I said, I don't understand what's going on. All my shifts are gone except for December the 6th. But I got a letter that said you're terminated effective December the 5th. So <laughs> what is the deal? Is it you just in a bind and you need somebody to work? Sure, I'll, I'll work for you. But I'm just kind of curious. What's the story here? Well, you know, if you want to stay on the schedule for two weeks or I said, look, this is the thing, my friend. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm really not. But I just want to let you know. They're either going to get the religious exemption or they're not. I'm not monkeying around with this thing. It either is or it isn't. I will work the Monday for you, but no, I'm not. I got to move on with my life. I got to, the Lord, you know, you know what she starts to tell me? I didn't even, I wasn't even playing in this, but you know what she tells me? She says, man, I'm a believer. Dude, I, now listen, this is kind of a big company. This is a person I ain't ever even met before. I mean, she kind of knows my story, but she's like, Matt, I'm a believer. 
And she said, I've been praying about this every day because she said, I'm not going to lie to you. This is causing me stress because you got a whole lot of shifts on this schedule. And I don't know how I'm going to fill it in. But I've been praying. She said, I even ministered at a church last night on God's unmerited favor and the grace of God. And I just want you to know, I've been praying about this thing. So I got the Holy Spirit all over right now. So I said, well, i tell you what, Nina. I'm about to go get, hop up in here and grab me a massage. But look, let's pray. Let's pray about this. So I prayed with her. And the reason I'm saying this is I was talking about people that have faith. There's been a few times I've prayed with Robert before. And I'm talking about in three minutes I got an answer. <laughs> three minutes, dude. I mean, if, if, I'm not trying to build up a man. I'm just trying to say that it ain't always happen. It doesn't always happen that way, right? Whenever you're praying, you get an answer in five minutes. At least four times when I pray with Robert. You know, it's like three minutes later, four minutes later, it's like I got an answer. All right. So anyway. I said, look, I pray for her. I pray that the Lord would minister to her life, that he'd bring her peace because she's going through stuff, right? And, and I prayed about the situation. Lord, may your will be done. Amen. So I go get my massage. I come back out. Now I don't know. She's claiming she ain't, isn't talking with HR. I, don't know. I come back and the, the lead NP sends me an emoji like a winky face with a tongue sticking out. Call me up. HR, I got information. And so, yeah, so here, here's, the, here's the deal. The, answer, the, 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 the prayer, the things already answered is what I, I guess I'm trying to say. What is my point? My point is, is that, and then I go to work yesterday and some guy's like, I'll just say you made it back from me. I'm like, dude, what are you, because I ain't going around talking to nobody about this. I'm just like keeping it hush hush. I'm not trying to be messy. And I'm like, how do you know about all that? All oh, people been come and ask about Matt Fair, blah, blah, blah. Amen. And, and I'm, I'm just like, dude, the Lord's over here working behind the scenes and making stuff happen. And I'm guessing that this is God's will for right now. Amen. Yes. What was my point to all of that? He will restore to you yes. what seems to have been stolen. And the main point I wanted to try to make was give you a practical example of God is working behind the scenes in ways that you can't even see what That's he's right. doing. That's right. Amen. Because I'm telling you right now, as far as I was concerned, man, I got to move on. I was making haste. Can I be real with you? You know how I can preach about hasty decisions? I was already making hasty decisions. I had already emailed like three different people. Then I had to go backwards and be like, well, you know, yeah. I'm sorry I emailed. Because they're like, oh, yeah, come work for us. Come work for us. So I'm just telling you that as soon as you think that something is closed off, the Lord knows how to, how to, how to take care of you and open yes. doors. Amen. Amen. Praise God. He will restore to you. Amen. <coughs> Number four. What is thy servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? He was humble and had a heart of gratitude towards the Lord. Amen? I just want to encourage you with that. To be humble and to have a heart of gratitude. Can the singers and musicians come, come forward? Because uh, we're going to go ahead and close. Listen, when we humble our heart before the Lord, you got to just be real with the Lord. Amen? Just be real with the Lord. Lord, I need you to do a work in my heart. The last thing that, uh, that I wanted to say came out of verse 10. Thou therefore and your sons and your servants shall till the land. I've already made this point, by the way. That's the point I just made. Whenever David says to Ziba, you and your sons and your servants will till the land for him and shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. The point that I wanted to make was this. God can make things work in your favor that you don't even see or realize that it's happening. You see what, I'm, what, what, what is my point? David told Ziba, your servants are going to plow the land for Mephibosheth. But Mephibosheth is going to be sitting at my table, eating bread at my table. So what I'm trying to say is, is that they over there working for Mephibosheth. They over there plowing the land. They plant the seed. They reaping the harvest. Mephibosheth got money going into his bank account, but he's just sitting at the kid. He's just sitting at the king's table eating bread. Amen. I preached it one time, and I mean, I started crawling around. Can you imagine that though? And I'm just going to close with that. Can you imagine that? This man could not even walk. I mean, th you got sometimes you gotta you gotta look at the Bible like it's a video. Hey, you ever seen a person do an army crawl? <laughs> like I, that's what I imagine. It, it, I mean, think about that. I mean, how big is a king's table? 
I don't know. How many people are sitting at the king's table every day? A lot of people. Sitting at the <laughs> king's table, and here comes Mephibosheth. Just like dragging his lame body up in there. Probably like picking himself up in that in that in that chair, sitting down, and everybody's just like looking around. But look, he belongs there, my Hallelujah. friend. He belongs there. King David said, no, he's going to eat at my table. He's going to eat the bread at my table. So you don't let the devil lie to you. You don't let nobody else lie to you. That says, oh, you're unworthy. You're not worthy to eat at the king's table. No, that's a lie. Amen. Let's close this service out. Let's worship the Lord. If you need prayer, amen, the altars are always open. Amen.